I want you to take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. Uh, we're studying the doctrine of the Bible doctrine of the Bible. And um, I, I, I changed my mind at the last second about what I was going to talk about tonight because I, I prepared this for uh, the teaching that I did down in Pea Ridge, Arkansas. And uh, I record, was not able to stream down there, but I was able to record it. We actually have it online. But I'm going to give you some of it tonight because it fits in with the topic um, that uh, we're studying on Wednesday night. We're going through basic doctrines of the Bible. And we've talked about God, who He is. We've talked about Jesus, who He is. We've talked about the Holy Spirit, who He is. And now we're talking about the Bible and what the Word of God is, what the Word of God isn't, and all the matters relating to the Word of God. And the, the bottom line is, if, if your doctrine concerning the Word of God is wrong, then you are setting yourself up for a change in what you believe about everything else related to God. And I'm going to show you why that is tonight, because it has to do with change, and why we should never, ever change the Bible that we use here in this church, those of you who watch us faithfully online, why nobody, don't let anybody ever talk you into changing or compromising the Bible issue. Don't let anybody ever do that. It may seem innocent at first, but the devil always does. Amen? So let's read Matthew 20, uh, chapter 7, verse 24. And um, amen. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him a wise liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. One thing that we know about rocks is that they do not change. There are statues that were carved out a hundred years ago, five hundred years ago that essentially are still exactly the same as they were when they were first carved out, especially the ones that have been indoors all of these years because they've not had weather beat down on them and things like that. They are essentially the same thing. So I will liken unto him a, a, a wise man which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain it descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Father, I pray, God, that you would bless our service tonight, bless the study of your word tonight. Lord, I'm very thankful for these that you have brought into this house tonight. Father, I cannot complain. I thank you, Lord, for those that you've gathered with us online and those, Lord, that will watch this message uh, for many days to come after uh, this meeting tonight. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would establish your people in their understanding of why we should never change our Bibles, why we should never change a word, why we should never change a verse, take a word out, put a word in, retranslate a word, retranslate a verse, why we should never stop believing what we believe about the Word of God tonight Father, reinforce that in our hearts because everything in this world changes except your word. And the grace that you bestow upon us, 
So, Father, I pray, God, that you would open our eyes tonight, teach us some good things tonight, and, Lord, maybe let this be an encouragement. Lord, there may be a reason why you changed what I was going to talk about tonight. Maybe somebody's watching or somebody will watch that needs to hear this. And they need to be encouraged in it because somebody's working against them. Somebody's working on them to try to pull them away from the Word of God. And I pray, dear God, that, that you would use this, in fact, you would use your Word, God, to convince them not to stray away from the things that we, have, that we have learned, the things that we have heard, the things that we have been confirmed in our hearts, the things that we know. Father, teach us, don't ever change. And we thank you, God, that you're a God that never changes. You're the same God that loved us yesterday, you loved us today, and you'll love us again tomorrow. So, Father, we thank you for that. Give us... Uh, sound wisdom in our minds and our hearts tonight uh, and we pray this in the name of Jesus our Lord and our Savior and all of God's people said amen I mentioned to the folks down in Pea Ridge that my dad's uh, occupation uh, during his lifetime was he got a job working for the um, Corps of Engineers he was a civilian he was never in the army, but he was working for the Corps of Engineers, and he worked, first of all, down in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, working on the, um, I think it was the Arkansas River down in there, maybe might have been the Mississippi River, uh, but then they transferred him when I was about probably maybe three years old uh, up to the St. Louis District, and they put him, I have pictures in my office of the boats that he worked on. One of them was called the Dredge Kennedy. And one of the things that he did was he was the dredging inspector. He was to go out in a little boat and it had uh, sonar equipment in it. And he would go back and forth in the river channel and they would use sonar and he would measure the depth of the water um, at, up and down the river channel. River channel depth is important because of barge traffic. A lot of materials are transported in this country still to this day by way of barges. Barges, those barge uh, boats there on the river, they have the ability to move tons and tons of grain, coal, uh, different types of gravel, you name it, they can, they can move up and down. They can go from the northern part of the country, bring things in from Canada, take it all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, they can do that. You've got all the river systems from the Appalachian Mountains that run into the Mississippi. Everything from this side of the Rocky Mountains runs into the Mississippi River. And it was my dad's job to make sure that the river channel stayed cleared because there was one thing that they knew about what laid at the bottom of the Mississippi River. What was at the bottom of that river was sand. And one thing they knew about sand is that it never stayed in the same place. Never. It was always on the move, always changing. And while they may have, he may have sounded an area out one month and said it's clear to navigate, they could have gone back the next month sounded the same area out and all of a sudden find out they need to dredge that area and yeah, i mean it's a great operation it just it was called a dustpan dredge they would lower that big huge dustpan about the width of this church down into the river and suck up all the silt they use cables to move the the front of the boat back and forth as they moved themselves up the river channel sucked up all the silt pumped it over to the side and when they got done, he would go back and sound it out to make sure that they had dredged to the proper depth, and then they would go somewhere else to look for something else to dredge. But sometimes they would have to go right back to the same place because sand was always on the move. And that's the point that Christ is making. There's a million sermons that could be preached on this, but one of those is that sand is always changing 
It's never stable, never stand still. You can never count on it to stay in the same place, especially when it comes to an ocean, when it comes to the forces of the river, when it comes to the dunes of the desert. You can never count on it to stay still. It's always going to be on the move. So I want you to think about this. A person's life being built upon the sand of Bibles that are always changing. Or a church, or a denomination, or a ministry, or any given doctrine if that doctrine is based upon the sand of these modern translations, that doctrine is always going to be in a state of transformation. What it was yesterday, it won't be today, and it won't be that same thing again tomorrow. W meanwhile, a life built upon a Bible that does not change is a life that's going to be steady, it's going to be solid. What you believed yesterday is the same thing you're going to believe today, and it's the same thing you're going to believe tomorrow because your Bible is not going to change what it says. Somebody say amen. Proverbs 24, turn there. Underline this verse in your Bible. Proverbs 24, 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not. Don't get involved with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them. So if you are looking for a church and, you're, and the church that you go to, they're using that the Sunday that you went, they used the King James. Well, uh, that's a good church. They used the King James. Go back another Sunday. See what they're using then. That may have been King James Sunday. The next Sunday, they're going to use the NIV, or they're going to use the New American Standard, or they're going to be using the Christian Standard, or they're going to be using the New Living Testament, or they're going to be using any of these other Bibles. That church is a church that is given to change. And I guarantee you what those Bibles said today, 20 years from now, they will not say the same thing. And I'm going to prove that to you. Look up here on the screen. How would you like to be camping and have this mosquito flying to you in your tent in the middle of the night with glowing red eyes, I would freak out and go home. Camping trip is over. So the article says, the gene drive dilemma. Now explain that. We can alter entire species, but should we? The answer is no, we shouldn't. And I've watched a lot of videos on DNA editing given by the people who have invented the process, given by people who use the process, who know it best. They tell us how great it is. They tell us that it has the potential to cure many diseases, to extend the lives of Millions of people all over the world, it, they tell us that it can alter, it can reverse the course of Alzheimer's, sickle cell anemia. It can do all kinds of wonderful things. And these same people who promote the use of DNA editing called CRISPR they may, in the course of that, they may say for about three minutes, now we know that, you know, it has the potential to do some serious harm. That's why we believe that we should set in place some rules and guidelines and regulations so that this does not occur. And then they move on to how great it is again. 
But you know as well as I do, there are people in this country who don't even follow the Constitution. To them, Cubby, it's a living document, meaning it can and should be changed depending on the times. And yet they swore an oath to defend and protect it. I don't believe them when they do that, by the way. I think they're lying through their... They're just trying to get elected. Okay? So think about it. What if, what if a non-elected bureaucrat took it upon himself to alter the Constitution however he wanted to alter it? Let me ask this crowd this question. If given the chance to alter any part of the Constitution that they wanted to, which one do you think they would alter first? Second Amendment. We were all on the same page. Why the Second Amendment? Huh? Because nobody can defend the rest of them. This is why I believe in the Second Amendment. Don't change the Second Amendment. Give us, by the way, go get that off my desk. Who was reading it? Wayne, get that off my desk. You've got to, i got to show you this. I think, I don't remember if it was Ron and Sandy gave it to me. I think it was Ron and Sandy gave it to me. There is a bill before the United the House of Representatives in the state of Missouri to make Missouri a sanctuary state. Now, that doesn't mean a sanctuary state for illegal aliens. It means a sanctuary state for the Second Amendment. Let me read to you what it says. Uh, this act creates the Second Amendment Preservation Act and lists various declarations of the Missouri General Assembly regarding the United States Constitution and the scope of the federal government's authority. In addition, the act declares that federal supremacy does not apply to federal laws that restrict or prohibit the manufacture, ownership, and use of firearms, firearm accessories, or ammunition within the state because such laws exceed the scope of the federal government's authority. Laws necessary for the regulation of the land of the United States Armed Forces are excluded from the types of federal firearms laws that exceed federal authority. In other words, what it does, it says. Let's say that by some fluke, Bernie Sanders gets to be president in 2020. Bernie Sanders will try everything within his power to enact all these new gun restrictions. This act here, if passed in the state of Missouri, will say to Bernie, not in Missouri, you can't do that here. We will defend our rights to our Second Amendment, and you can't stop us. And if you come in to try to stop us, meet us at the Mississippi River, because we will be standing there armed and loaded. I would hate that it would ever come to that. But if you think that I'm going to give up my Second Amendment rights, my Second Amendment rights protect my rights to free speech. So anyway, gene drive dilemma. We can alter entire species, but should we? So I hear all these commercials from these people about how we can alter genetics. We can alter the genetics of practically every species on this planet and none of them are saying how bad this is going to turn out they're all saying how good this is going to be don't believe so go back to that verse meddle not with them that are given to change meddle not with them now um genesis 3 let me let me read this to you you can turn there and I'll read to you what I wrote. Satan's pattern from the beginning shows 
He always attacks and seeks either to alter or eliminate the source of truth. That's his pattern over and over through the Bible. That's we see consistently that's what he does. Serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. I think Eve must have been a Democrat there. She felt like she could change God's law. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. There's, there was the replacement law now. So number one, question God's law. Number two, contradict God's law. Number three, offer a replacement for God's law. But Satan's pattern from the beginning shows he always attacks and seeks either to alter or eliminate the source of truth. Matthew 13, 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. So anybody who hears the word of God, when their life is full of devils, when everything they do in their life, just devils just are with them every, every waking hour, every waking minute, the moment they hear the gospel, the devil tries to pervert that in their mind somehow, tries to draw their attention away from it, tries to distract them away from it, tries to, I mean, I remember, I, I remember one time, Lisa remembers this, years ago, um, I was preaching a youth camp, and God was just really working with the young people. It came time for the service, there was a couple of sodomite women that showed up. To, this was the last night of camp. There was a couple of sodomite women showed up. They came to pick up their, uh, their children from the camp. And that instantly brought a state of confusion to that camp. As I started preaching, I noticed that there was guys walking up and down the aisle. And they were, it's like they were looking for somebody. And finally I said, guys, what's going on? They said, we have a camper missing. And it ended up, we had to call off the service. Had Everybody had to go back to their, camp, their cabins so that we could find this one camper. You know, it's bad when you lose a child at a camp. They'll shut that camp down. And after a while, they found her. Do you know who it was? And, they, and I kept asking, I, I would ask the people running the camp, I said, are we going to have a service or not? And they said, well, that's up to you. And I'm going, I don't know what to do. Do you know who it was that talked me into having the service? It was the kids. They wanted me to preach that night. Okay? But the presence of those spirits that were there that night created the chaos so that those kids, and you know what I was going to preach about that night? The Bible. I'm not kidding you. I was going to preach on the Bible. And that chaos almost destroyed that message for that night. Okay? That's how he works. Now, um, again, Matthew 13, 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. I want you to take your Bible, turn to John chapter 3 if you would. John chapter 3. Very quickly. Because I'm going to show you something. Now, I've used this illustration before. When the tares and the wheat are both green it takes an expert to figure out which is which I, I understand people 
who can get, because they've not looked into the issue, they trust their pastor, their pastor tells them there's no difference between the King James and modern translations, but the modern translations are easier to understand, so we're going to use all the modern translations. I understand that because at, at the early ages, the difference between wheat and tares, you have to really know. And I was at a church one time, and, and, and I always like to try to set people up and show them how wrong they are, but I was at a church one time, and I asked people there, who can tell me? I've got wheat and tares up on the screen. Who can tell me which is the wheat and which is the tares? And I had an old boy raise his hand. He said, the one on the right is the tares. And I, what I wanted to do was lie to him and say, nah, you're wrong. But I knew he was right because I knew which one I put up there. And I said, how do you know? And he said, I've dealt with this before. I, I know the husks. I know what they're supposed to look like. And I'm telling you, the one on the right is the tares and the one on the left is the wheat. And I said, well, we'll just see about that. Well, he was right, of course. Okay. Okay. Both say Holy Bible. And you cannot tell by the cover. And, and, I'm going to show you this. Um, Satan's subtle nature. Remember, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The first non-King James Bible that came out in English. Does anybody know what it was? That, that, that gained wide acceptance. Okay? Uh, um, Daniel Webster translated the New Testament, but no one was waiting in line to buy his Bible, okay? But the first widely accepted translation of the Bible, other than the King James, does anybody know what it was? Huh? Nope. Huh? Nope. Some of you are close. Okay, let, let me read this to you. Satan's subtle nature shows that the change, that the changes never occur all at once. Always slowly enough as to not be immediately detected. So I have an example up on the screen. Read that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So far, sounds right, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, now, huh? Okay, now, there is no difference between eternal and everlasting. Because John 3.15 in the King James says eternal life. John 3.16 says everlasting life. There's no, there's no difference. So could I use, and I won't tell you which Bible this is, but could I use this verse and lead someone with it to Jesus? Okay. Because it's basic, it says basically the same thing. Okay. This is the revised version, not the revised standard version. The revised version came out in 1885. And let me, let me explain how that came to be. I don't know who exactly was king at the time. It may have been another King George. But the king at the time wanted to update the language of the king's Bible. Because remember the king, the monarchy, held the copyright to the king's Bible, the royal letters patent. And no one could authorize its change except the king. Only the king could do that. So the king, you all right there, Steve? You got full of the Holy Ghost there for a second. The Holy Wasp. So anyway, the king said, let's, 
let's update the language. Okay? So he hired Westcott and Hort. Well, Fenton Hort was a member of a secret society. Okay? And both of these guys were heretics. Westcott and Hort both were heretics. But they were scholars from Cambridge and Oxford, so he hired them to update the language. By the time they got done, the king realized this is not an update of the language. This is completely different because they used the corrupted Greek text. So 1885, it was called the revised version, not the authorized version or the new authorized version. It was a completely different Bible because there was 30,000 changes just in the New Testament between the King James and the revised version of 1885. 30,000 changes. Now, to, to just look at John 3.16, to me, that's an acceptable change. And let me explain a little bit about DNA, too. DNA works the same way. There's more than one way that DNA can build a protein that your body needs. There's more than one way to do it. And if you've ever noticed the differences between the Old Testament and the way the New Testament quotes an Old Testament verse, most of the time, the way the New Testament quotes it, it's different. But it's, inspired, it's an inspired difference, meaning God is doing the same thing, just using different words to do it. Okay? There's, so it is, there are acceptable changes. So if I, were to say, if I were to say to someone, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I'm still saying everlasting life. I'm, it's still the same thing. It, it can accomplish the same goal. Okay? But then when you back up and look and see that the West Cotton Hort 1885 Bible had over 30,000 changes just to the New Testament, well, those changes must have been very subtle. Very subtle. But important. It just wasn't important enough in John 3.16 to make a difference. Okay? But it was a change. An alteration. But it was a subtle one. So now, so here is the 1885, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting, have eternal life. But now, the revised version becomes the revised standard version, which says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's a significant difference. Because Jesus is not God's only son. We are are sons of God, okay? Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then the RV, revised version, becomes the revised standard version, which then years later becomes the new revised standard version, which is the gender-neutral Bible. Taking he and him and her out and d demasculization mas de of the Bible, neutering the language of scriptures, okay? Then another offshoot of the Revised Standard Version was the English Standard Version. So as an alternative to the new Revised Standard in 2001, Crossway Bibles released its own Protestant Evangelical Revision of the RSV called the English Standard Version, this version was commissioned for the purpose of modifying the RSV passages 
that conservatives had long disputed, such as the Revised Standard Version is the one that in Isaiah 7, 14, instead of saying a virgin shall conceive, it said a young woman shall conceive. And a lot of evangelicals and conservatives did not like that. They said, no, it had to be a virgin, not a young woman. So the English Standard Version said, we'll fix it back. But then it kept the gender-neutral language, okay? Um, changed, it was changed back to virgin, but unlike its counterpart, it used only a small amount of the gender-neutral language. It still kept the gender-neutral language. Um, here's Westcott and Hort. I won't get into all of this. Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. You know what your belly is? It's the seed of your desires, your lusts, your emotions. They serve their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. Um... I'm not going to give you all of that. Okay, look at that. Callie, one of those up there is a gorilla. Wayne, hush. <laughs> one of those up there is a gorilla. One of them isn't. Think you can pick out which one's the gorilla? Smart girl. Do you know how much difference in the DNA there is between me and that gorilla? Just a little over a 1% difference. And humans can build bridges across rivers that they can't cross, make boats, build houses, cure diseases, build airplanes, build rockets that go into outer space to the moon, build computers that can play chess, Gorillas can't even play chess. You see the difference that 1% in DNA makes between humans and a gorilla. So does it matter? Does it matter if it's changed? Absolutely it does. It makes a big difference if it's changed. Um, I've mentioned this before. The International Bible Society Greek New Testament is now in its 28th edition. Meaning from when Eberhard Nessel came out with his first Greek text in the late 1800s, they've changed it 27 times. And here's what they've done. Wayne, one year in the Greek text, they would take out words. 20 years later, they would say, oh, we found another manuscript, and they would put those words back in. And it's always in a constant state of change. There will never, there will never, ever be a Greek New Testament that they will call the last and final edition of the Greek text. Never. It'll never happen. However, when it comes to 
We are not as can many which corrupt the word of God. When it comes to the King James, oh, l- let me show you this. Because, remember I told you I bought my wife an NIV years ago when I was not so smart. She was smarter than I was. She looked at it and she said, I don't like it. And I'm going, great, I just wasted 50 bucks. And in 1993, that is a lot of money. Okay, when I was making $7 an hour, that was a lot of money. Okay. Come to find out, if I were to go buy an NIV right now, it's not the same NIV as was is out in 1984. And if you look up on the screen, up here at the top, the NIV from 2011 and the verses that are in the 1984 60% of the verses are the same. 40% of the verses between the NIV of 1984 and the NIV of 2011 are different. 40%. That's almost half. You split the difference between 60 and 40, that's 50. Almost half of the verses between the NIV of 1984 and the NIV of 2011 are different. So if you, if you bought a Bible 15 years ago and it was an NIV, you better go get you a new one because if your preacher reads from a 2011 NIV, he will not be reading the same Bible that you're reading because you got yours 15 years ago. You know what that's called? Sand. Sand. Meddle not with them that are given to change. And the 2011 Bible, is it going to change? You're almost guaranteed that 10 years from now, the 2011 NIV Bible is going to be redone and it's going to be different than the 2011 version and the 1984 version. Meanwhile, According to the American Bible Society, 1850, none, not one word of our King James Bible has been altered since 1611. Not once. Amen. You're going to see and you don't, you don't have to understand how it works, how CRISPR works, how they edit DNA, but suffice it to say, they have made it so easy now that they're making big plans on all the species. Uh, Michael told me, and this bothered me, this bothered me yesterday, a plague of locusts went through Turkana and Samburu, Kenya. Okay? Those people did not need that. So let's edit the DNA of the locusts so that they can't breed. And we can wipe them out. But should we? No, because who knows what else, what ripple effect that will have on the rest of the world. Should we edit the mosquitoes so they no longer carry malaria? No, because who knows what effect that's going to have on the rest of the balance of nature. Should we edit the DNA of any species of animals? No. What about humans? Especially humans. Because we're playing God and we're not God. We're not smart enough to do it. We have no idea what we're messing with. 
And I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not. When you read the book of Revelation, you know what you see happening on earth? Plagues everywhere. I wonder why. I don't think the plagues come down from heaven so much as they're the result of man did it to himself. That's what I think. So, we don't have 125 people sitting in the church tonight. Because people, they want to go to churches that have changed. And we're not. And we're not going to. We're not going to. Because once you start changing, I like what you just did, Josiah. You just, just, you're just going to keep on changing, keep on changing, keep on changing. Until all of a sudden, Josiah's a woman. Well, I'm picking on you a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you brought it up. You went like that. And I'm going, okay, see, he gets it. <laughs> Meddle not with those that are given to change. Amen? Don't, don't be around them. Don't give in. Don't give in.